Welcome to the third episode of the Digital Native Podcast. I'm Rob, and I'm a Solutions Architect at Databricks. I'm Anya, and I'm also a Solution Architect at Databricks. And we're delighted to be joined by our guest today, Lexi. I'm Lexi Casson. I'm Lead Data and AI Strategist at Databricks. Awesome. So what I'd love to know, actually, is your journey into the field and how you became a data and AI Strategist. I was wondering if you can kind of give an overview of what attracted you to the field and, I guess, like, how you've kind of changed roles over the different years. Sure. The attracting into the field part came from a love of math. It wasn't necessarily that I was great at math. In fact, most of the time, I think I was like a B student in math, which is not plural because I'm American. Sorry, you don't get an S on the end of math. It's, it was just that I loved it. Every day after school, like that was the first homework I did. That was the first subject I wanted to study and look into. And as I continued into university and then grad school and then into industry, I followed where the math was and eventually found statistics and found data work mainly because of statistics. I didn't really go into specifically data at the time. There wasn't a field called data science. There wasn't a field called data analytics. It was just math or applied math of some variety. When I got out into the working world, I started as a business analyst. And in a way, I feel like I never left being a business analyst because really what you're doing is understanding a system and, and an ecosystem in which it works and how it integrates and it's just solving problems. It's really analyzing and solving problems. And so I feel like I never stopped being a business analyst. It's just changed form. And then followed math into mostly consumer analytics. And eventually it was told, oh, yeah, so you're a data scientist. I went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had been a statistician. I had been a CRM analyst. Then that turned into being a data scientist. And then from there just kind of kept going. Eventually, you come across enough problems and enough places when you're in agency work or in consulting work, which I'd been in, that you start to see patterns and you start to understand how businesses are approaching their strategy, how they're building that strategy, what they're looking for, how they're leveraging data and analytics to try to support that. And so it just sort of followed along. I don't know how intentional that really was. I just kind of kept going. And now here I am. <laughs> I find it really interesting because it's like a meme where um, overnight all these kind of like math practitioners and experts became AI experts suddenly. Um, and actually, I'm just going to jump to like maybe my favorite question, which is right now, obviously, AI is so trendy with Gen AI and LLMs. And what's your kind of opinion looking at also business use cases um, and the hype cycle we're in? Do you see a lot of tangible value or do you see it being a lot of overhyped in some situations as well? I do think there's a lot of tangible value for generative AI, but I especially think that the value comes from combining generative AI with more traditional machine learning techniques and creating ecosystems of models that allow you to answer questions in a reproducible way that bring more clarity. Because I feel like generative AI, we don't understand how it works. I mean, we know how it's built, kind of, but we don't really know how it's working. And that reproducibility is very difficult to achieve. And so when I look at businesses and how they evaluate governance and how they look at the need for reproducibility and consistency in results, I think it's very important to understand that the types of models that give you that are not generative AI typically. They're going to be things more like predictive or prescriptive models that have a statistical backing that we can kind of dissect better. And so I see a lot of organizations approaching generative AI, and then realizing that actually what they need is the entire AI stack and understanding that means more than just, okay, I'm going to go tap into an LLM model somewhere and everything will be fine. So I think that it's opened the eyes of a lot of organizations to the value that's there, but also to all of the necessary steps that get you the real answer. Fantastic. And Alexei, if you speak to the CTO or the CEO of company, you know, some of the execs and they ask you, there is so much going on in the field of generative AI, AI, and I don't know where to start and I don't know how to stay up to date with everything or not being carried away by the hype. What would be your three tips to them? Three tips to stay current? Gosh. So the ones that I tend to go towards are following a lot of different types of news. So not just the tech news, but also the business news. The places I would say to look are, you know, across podcasts of different styles like this. 
across traditional news outlets and then also potentially leaders in the space. So whether you're following them on LinkedIn or if they have their own newsletters or what have you, I would probably look to those and try to get a good mix of the evangelists for generative AI, as well as potentially some of the folks who are, I won't say detractors, but who are maybe a little more cautious around the possibilities. The other thing that, you know, of course, is very dear to me is ethics and responsible AI. And so I would say before you get carried away, think about what you do and don't want to be known for with AI and how much risk you're willing to take which tends to be on the minds of CTOs and CEOs anyway, but it's something to also look into. And in terms of owning your data to build a LLM model, what is your opinion there? Black box versus <laughs> building your own. Oh, I see. In terms of the data or in terms of the model? In terms of some model. Okay. So in terms of the model, I think it's unlikely to be profitable to build your own full LLM model. These are, in fact, large language models. They take a lot more data than most organizations will have or have properly curated to be able to build a model that they would trust. So I think it's worthwhile to evaluate doing things like retrieval augmentation or fine-tuning rather than necessarily building your own model from scratch because Simply, it's just easier to access. It's easier to control. There's a little bit more value kind of overall in that ROI. So I think that's where I would start. If there's a really compelling use case and you've got all the data and you think that you can get there, give it a try, but be prepared to invest a lot to do it. I think one thing that's really interesting that you mentioned was ethics and already on this podcast quite a lot we've discussed about hallucinations and keeping human in the loop and i'd love to know because i feel like in tech there's often a move fast break things mentality what should be the strategy when it comes to generative ai what should be the, the compromise when you go and put a gen ai system in production and how should you kind of weight the rewards and risks well i think that's specific to each organization. And we're seeing a lot more regulation coming in that rebalances those risks and rewards because certain things are deemed too much risk to be put in. With generative AI in particular, I think that the approach that we've seen thus far has been to start with internal use cases, meaning things that tools that will come into use specifically for those users within an organization as opposed to potentially going out to their consumers. That said, over time, a lot of the valuable use cases are to be used in consumer-facing applications, and that becomes a riskier proposition. So I think when it comes to ethics and some of the safeguards, you have to really think about who are your users, how much can you educate them, and then what safeguards can you put in place. With generative AI, it is more challenging in some ways. A lot of the approaches that we're currently using are things like grounding or creating prompts that allow for kind of a translation of what a user asks into something that is a more controlled question to the model or potentially putting in a filtering mechanism after someone has introduced a prompt. First of all, to evaluate their prompt and say, is this something that is biased? Is it harmful? Is it safe? Is it you know, whatever other criteria you want? Is it toxic? And then assuming that the prompt gets through, what does the response look like? And evaluating all of those criteria for the response that's then generated. Where that gets a little bit interesting is thinking about what's sort of the hierarchy of decisions of what gets through. And a great example of this was in the news recently where a company had a chatbot that was interacting with a customer. And the primary function of the chatbot was to be helpful to the customer. But they did it at the detriment of the company's reputation. So I'm not going to name and shame the company, but if you look in the news, you'll find it. And, uh, you know, it's a matter of understanding then what really do you want it to do? I, I feel like generative AI to a great degree is like asking a wish of a genie. You have to be really cautious how you word that because it's going to follow those words and you might not get the results you thought. Did somebody else bring up that example? Yes, for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think there's also been like even a few in the last few days even. Um, oh, I'm sure. 
Uh, it's, it is, it's really interesting. And I, I think I really agree about it being really industry specific. For example, working on in some applications in healthcare, it can be very different in terms of how you balance those, for example, false positives or false negatives, because you get like this incredible expressi expressivity with these systems. But because it's so uninterpretable, we just don't ha we can't treat errors in the same way we would for a human or a, or a simple interpretable system with rules we can understand. Very much so. And this is even in classic machine learning and other applications, high regulated industries are highly regulated for a reason. You look at the sensitivity of models and the power of models differently when you're talking about a literal life or death situation than you do in the case of something that's less risky or that's less impactful. Does it really matter that I receive an ad for the particular brand that I want versus do I get the correct diagnosis of a health issue when I go to a physician, the risk and reward is very different. And so you have to consider that regardless, you know, when you're in different industries. And that's also part of why regulation specifies in a number of ways, what are those use cases? What are those impacts where we really want to put more scrutiny and we need to make sure that things are acting as safely as we can make them? It's really interesting when it comes to scrutiny, as you highlighted, and there's currently some different approaches in Europe, in the US, in, in UK. What's your kind of position and how do you think that the landscape will change going forward with obviously some regulation right now in Europe being considered perhaps in the UK and a little bit in the US? And how do you think that will play out for different industries? I think what we're going to see is that broadly the industries that have been highly regulated are continuing to be highly regulated because they started that way for a reason. What we're seeing now in the U.S. is largely applying rules that already existed in terms of what laws were there, you know, what's considered to be acceptable or unacceptable practice is now being applied to AI. So you're not allowed to discriminate when you're hiring someone. You're also not allowed to discriminate when hiring someone if you're using an AI. It, it's sort of the same types of things. You're not allowed to give people information about potentially harmful things. You're not allowed to do that if you're using AI to do it. It's sort of the same. In Europe, they're taking a different approach, but I feel that there is going to be a longer tail of trying to understand what that means. Because of the risk-based stratification, they're saying, oh, you know, high risk includes things like this list. That will not be all-encompassing. And so I think what we're going to see is that over the course of time, as various lawsuits come up and new, new instances of problems occur that maybe we didn't plan for, that they're going to start expanding different lists and trying to classify it. And I think we're going to end up having more of that risk-based approach. I do think that it allows for it to be a more uh, pervasive law for Europe than for the states because it is more case-specific in the states right now. But I think it's also because it is more specific, it's more enforceable. And that's something that I don't necessarily see yet with the EUAI Act. And then there are, you know, there are other approaches out there. Right now, the UK has been pretty laissez-faire about all of it. And there are a lot of recommendations, but not a lot of regulation. And so I think over time, we'll see that the pro-innovation approach can only get you so far. And at some point, there will need to be at least some amount of distinction as to what can or should be regulated. I think it actually linked back to a point you were saying earlier about when it comes to governance. And one thing that I think we've heard a little bit on this podcast is how actually some of these more, these like Gen AI use cases can drive governance as a topic. How do you see that playing out? Do you think that it's a genuine driver for governance? And do you think that, that then has positive impacts for the, for the rest of the data platform, the data stack? I think it's definitely brought to the fore a number of issues around data management and governance. It, it's not just the AI governance, which of course is the obvious one, but it's also the data governance and an increased emphasis on privacy beyond what GDPR did, beyond what other privacy regulations have put in place. It's thinking about privacy, not just from a consumer privacy, but also a sudden rush of IP protection and copyright protection and a whole new outlook on what that means. And so I think governance now and security now is actually uh, more of a focus. So we've been talking about particularly data governance, but when we think about governance overall, 
you know, I think it's more than just the data. You know, models have always had governance. And we, you know, whether you're in a regulated industry or not, you don't necessarily just say, oh, well, we can put anything at all into a model. So there's always been some governance. It's a question now of how much focus it gets. I do think it's a positive thing for the stack overall, for data and AI holistically, because I think it helps to frame what the roles and responsibilities are and how just how vast they are. It's not just a data governance office problem, which is, you know, somebody's least favorite office in their organization. Data governance was a dirty word until a few years ago, it felt like. Nobody wanted to talk about it. And now governance is being seen as the enabling capability that allows you the trust in what you're building to actually put it into production so that you can gain the the rewards that you're trying to gain. Um, And so I think that focus is very helpful across the board. In fact, like just taking your role as an AI strategist and the way you speak about how governance being a dirty word and now you're seeing this pattern where it's, it's becoming actually something that people are seeing real, real value from. What would you say are the main areas that when you go in to do assist a team, what kind of patterns do you normally, the most common that you pick out from other teams that you, you would use to, to improve them or empower them? Specifically for governance Zip around AI. AI. So the things that I tend to see in terms of groups that are trying to approach AI, especially if they've been in a a kind of lack of AI in the organization, is understanding what they need to do as a foundation, how that governance folds in, and how they can develop AI from the start. How do they articulate the value of that? How do they prioritize? There is a lot of appetite now for AI, and so organizations who are just approaching it haven't done this before and are saying, okay, well, how do we make sure that we're getting to that value and how do we scale it? I've seen a number of organizations where they've kind of hired their first data scientist and and that person pulls some data into their laptop or, you know, hits an AI model that's out there, you know, open and available. And then over time they say, yeah, this looks like a great POC. How do we get it into production? And they sort of twiddle their thumbs and look away and hope somebody else has an answer. So I think getting to that first step, getting that first model into production, understanding what production looks like, and then understanding what AI looks like as a product in production is a little bit different. So how do you take a model as you know, AI and data science have always been an iterative thing. You know, an AI model is sort of never done. Even ChatGPT, which came out, it was like three, then 3.5, then four. Now we're talking about five. And, you know, it iterates. You, you want to improve it over time. So what does it look like to product manage AI? And that's something that I've been having a, a lot of conversations with our customers around lately and helping teams to understand what does it mean to support AI? What does it mean to manage AI? What does it mean to get out of the lab and into production? And then what do you need to do? to support your end users in understanding that AI is not truth. AI is a probability, and you need to be able to decompose a little bit of what's being said to you and do some due diligence and then try and make sure that you've got something that you're able to use. Not necessarily trust, but use. Oh, that's very interesting. And it's also, I think like the strategy, there are two kind of components of that. One of them, efficiency of the data science team and how they move things into production. And another one, acceptance of the organization and integration of AI into organization, the change management. So what is your approach to this kind of post-production world? In terms of accepting AI or In terms of acceptance, so let's say we were talking about, you know, building internal tools for automation, for changing like internal processes how to make it successful, how to say, okay, we're going to change the way we work. It's not AI model that the data science team played with and now pushing onto you. And how to make sure that AI gets integrated into the processes rather than, you know, stays on the shelf as uh, another research project by our nerdy data science team. So I think that you have to start that process before you start the data science. Because, you know, one of the things that I glossed over in my past, I was a product manager. And when you start a new product and you're looking at where is my product market fit going to be, I need to figure out who my consumers are and what problem they actually have that I'm trying to solve. 
And if you're not doing that at the start, before you even look at what potential AI you might want to apply to it, you're destined to fail because you're kind of hoping that whatever you come up with, whatever limited knowledge of somebody else's job you think you have, that you're kind of hoping that they'll want it. And that's a very slight chance that it's actually going to solve the problem. So if if you're looking at building these tools and you're looking at building something that's going to solve a problem, first understand the problem, right? Solution it out first. Try and figure out what it is you need to build. It may or may not include Gen AI. may or may not include AI at all. It might be a graph. It might be a dashboard. It might be, don't ever say I said this, a spreadsheet. (laughs) Oh, I feel dirty for saying that. But at the end of the day, you need to make sure that the thing that you provide to your end user is of value to them and helps them in creating something new or doing their job better. Otherwise, it's just a project. It's just a little science project in a lab. I think that's one thing we've touched on a lot, actually, how also data science, machine learning has been as it's becoming, you know, you're becoming more of an engineering problem than a science problem. Like these teams of the past where you're just scientists doing more like an academic research problem within an enterprise is beginning to change. And we've also discussed a little bit around customer services, a very common use case where Gen AI is starting to be implemented somewhat because you can have human in the loop to try and handle some of the potential issues around hallucinations and you can kind of verify the content. Do you see that as kind of a major use case? What do you kind of see as like very common achievable use cases in the kind of upcoming months for Gen AI? I think that's one that has been very approachable because there is a lot of built-in safeguarding, assuming that you're not supplanting your customer service staff. The other ones that I see quite often are things like accelerated onboarding or training materials, or a lot of the internal ones are things like you know, policy interaction. If you, have to inter- if you have to ask questions around your HR policy or your legal policies and compliance or things like that, or being able to summarize documents like contracts and things like that that no, nobody ever wants to read legalese. If there had been a translator for legalese to English years ago, I'd have been using it. But, you know, those are things that are very easily accomplished in a way. Some of them maybe with a little bit higher risk than others. You know, legal contract summarization, you end up losing a lot of nuance, which I'm sure someone spent a lot of time redlining. But, you know, every word in contracts is important. Just ask a lawyer. So, you know, I think some of that can be done. And it's, again, there's a little bit more opportunity to have uh, a person who's interpreting it versus something that is more customer facing. There isn't that human in the loop. There isn't that extra filter. Um, And so those are the ones that we're seeing quite often kind of coming in right now. The other part of that, of course, is tech for tech's sake, because we always build things to try and make our jobs easier. So, you know, we see a lot of these assistants for coding and, and things like that, or assistants for you know, analytics and building new visualization and the stuff that the folks who are building it understand really well because they're their own customer now, which means that they don't have to go and talk to people who have a different problem and a different job. They can understand quite quickly whether this is helpful to them. And so we've seen a lot of that coming out also. But I think over time that will will start to break out of that part and get into, you know, more of the use cases that are customer facing, more of the things that are going to be really impactful in those places and we see them a little bit here and there but they tend to be the oddities that people talk about yeah that's true i think like in terms of customer facing AI application uh, having the right way to evaluate your llm applications gen ai applications is very important and having framework and it was actually interesting like rob and i we had a workshop the other day and uh, we had a room full of you know databricks users or aspiring databricks users and we asked them, how are you going to evaluate your Gen AI application? And they were like, the answer is, I don't know. So it's very early for quite a few companies. And uh, we're just starting this journey. But what is your opinion? You know, what are some good principles of evaluating Gen AI output? What type of metrics would you suggest? Not necessarily mathematical, but in terms of is it toxicity, professionalism, anything else? I think it depends on the context. I mean, if you're talking about, can I build an LLM that interacts with gamers on, you know, within the context of a game, do I care that it's professional? Probably not. 
that might be detracting to the experience because they expect a certain level of colloquialism and let's say gamerism, you know, those, those kinds of things that you just say because you're in that industry, which I used to be in at one point. So, you know, there are certain things that you wouldn't expect it to be. And so it's not necessarily a hard and fast that it must be all these things. It's more that, you know, is it appropriate to the use? I think it's also important to realize that while we would love to be able to say a human can look at all of these things and figure out if it's doing the right thing, we don't scale. That's the whole point of using AI is to help scale what otherwise is a non-scalable problem. And so it becomes more important to look at how do we use AI to judge AI. So rather than saying, oh, I'm going to have a person look through these 200,000 responses, you know, prompts and responses that an LLM had, how do I get an LLM to evaluate the prompts and responses and say, do you think this is appropriate based on this list of appropriate things we provided you? And get it to retrain itself, right? It's that sort of adversarial neural network concept that we've had for a long time. I, I tend to hearken back to a lot of the older, this is horrible to say, uh, older techniques, artificial ne neural networks have not been around for that long and adversarial networks even less. We're actually ancient now. Uh, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Youngin. But it's these are things that have built up over time from other concepts. And so I think it's important to understand that we can still use those concepts. We can still use those techniques to create better results because we know that's more scalable than what we can otherwise do. Yeah, it's very interesting because in traditional ML, right, you have a very prescribed metrics mm -hmm. and they're very like mass focused, such as precision, recall. And in case of LLMs, it's yes, you can have LLM as a judge, but you need to define metrics yourself and they can be domain specific. So there is not one size fits it all. It's very kind of an interesting territory and it'll be interesting to see how it's going to develop. It's very contextual. You know, there, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is how do you remove bias? And the answer is you don't. You figure out if it's biased in the way that you want it to be biased. You figure out if it's fair in, in as much as you think it's fair. As an organization, what does fairness mean? What does correctness mean? You know, sort of like the example I was referring to earlier where you don't ever want your LLM to say that your company is the worst in its industry. Not because that maybe is the most truthful or the fairest, but because that's the outcome. That's the bias you want it to present is you want it to make sure that it's saying good things about your own organization. And so it's not necessarily how do we make it as perfect can be. It's, is it right in context? Is it right in what it's supposed to be doing? Right enough to be used. And it almost feels like the landscape of data science team can change as well. We can have like new roles such as AI responsibility strategist or athe like athletes. <laughs> I was speaking with an organization earlier today who has been building out their AI ethics team. Mm -hmm. AI governance and AI ethics are absolutely something that larger organizations are building as capabilities and bringing in. Some of these folks are coming from government or NGOs because ethics, of course, is a, a massive focus. And so where we're starting to see needs in the domain of data and AI is very much around ethics and governance for AI, understanding what ethical principles should be put in place for an organization, dissecting that, pulling it into policy, bringing that policy into practice and saying, what is it that we can control? What is it we can't control? And how do we want to govern those types of things? How do we risk manage AI in a way that potentially some of these organizations never had in the past? And so we absolutely see these types of groups being adjacent to data science and AI teams, AI development teams, being the compliance side, being the kind of referees in a way um, to say, is this following what we need it to follow in order to mitigate the risks and enable the organization and allow us to see the value? I think the creation of these new roles is really interesting. But I'm wondering if there's also a flip side to this, which is with these new techniques, which can make us all more efficient, like taking down a software engineer with co-pilot, you can technically be much more productive, actually. Do you see any kind of reduction in the size of teams, given if you could be more efficient? At least there's some speculation that, for example, it's harder for junior engineers to break into the market right now because 
with senior engineers of co-pilot can be so productive or do you see any of that or is that more like speculation? Not yet. If anything, I see um, a desire to use more junior resources because with things like co-pilots and, you know, assistants and so forth, those junior level folks who cost less per resource typically can be as efficient and productive as a more senior person without an AI. And so how do you start to scale your team and work through a backlog? Well, you average your cost down. So I don't see it yet. And I think that what we do see, and this is something that it's not been studied a tremendous amount, but the few studies that have come out is that more senior resources don't necessarily get as much value from these AIs as more junior resources because they already know what they're doing. And so they're much quicker anyway at building the things they need to build versus a more junior person who doesn't necessarily know who prior to the advent of these LLM assistants would probably be going onto Google and Stack Overflow and saying, hey, how do I write this? And then copy and pasting and editing. And look, we've all been there. So, you know, it's a different mentality of how do you compose a team? You still want someone who understands a wealth of problems. So a more senior person who can give guidance, but a more junior person might be able to be just as efficient now without having to have as big a price tag. So while we've not seen it yet, I think the reason we've not seen a tremendous amount of um, layoff for this purpose yet is that there's a lot of pent up demand. Certainly in our industry, we've seen that there's been a massive call for additional resource for years. We just don't have enough people. All the more reason to have AIs that can help. But at some point, the appetite for change and the kind of change fatigue is going to start to set in to say, okay, we got through the majority of our backlog, now what? There's always going to be more projects. There's always going to be more things that we want to build. Um, but I have a feeling that you're going to get to a point where you've kind of gotten through the bulk, and now it's the incremental, and then we're going to start to see a, a bigger hit. Okay. And what's about business users? So we hear a lot of term called data democratization. And how would you see the life of business people changing, how they're going to interact with the data. Data democratization is an interesting one because it's not necessarily that we want to put data in the hands of everyone. We want to make their job easier, whatever that is to their job. For some of them, it may be more prescriptive. It might be you know, less having to dig for things and just giving access to a different set of tools versus saying, you now have the ability to go analyze things. Most people are not going to say, as much as I wish they would, I want to go analyze data all day. Would have been me, but, you know, I realize that's not the experience of most folks out there. They're not all analysts. What they want is something that makes their lives incrementally easier. They want their jobs to be made less mundane, that, you know, makes it just kind of smooths the skids a bit for them to be able to use the information in a different way, not necessarily have to go through the data, but to be, in a way, fed the information that will help them. And that could also lead to more automation. So one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, they get to a point where they're saying, well, AI can tell me all these things. Why doesn't it just do it for me? Well, you can do that, you know? And so then what's what remains of that job? What's the next step? And, you know, what if that becomes automated? What if it still continues to need to be manually supervised? Those are the things that start to change when we look at data democratization. It's really about, again, understanding the jobs that they need to do, understanding how you're going to curate their experience and, and what that looks like to them. And then over time, it will iterate. It will start to automate some of it or start to look at, what do they really need? Is it always a box where they can ask one question or is it a dashboard where they can see the answers to all the questions all at once? These things are still all valid and depending on what they're trying to do might still be the right answer. I'm not gonna lie, I've, I've learned a lot so far. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've had like a tutorial in like strategic AI. It's just podcast. I think one thing that you, um, you commonly return to, which is actually similar to other guests, is that you put a lot of emphasis on business requirements and tying everything back to that. I guess AI is in somewhat of a hype cycle right now. And 
it's common for, you know, you can solve business use cases with a dashboard or with a, a data pipeline, and you can just use AI simply as branding. You don't need to be using any sophisticated machine learning under the hood. What do you, do you think that like, a majority of actual kind of business use cases, a lot of the value from data actually comes from simple, just pipelines producing good quality data and machine learning is somewhat niche for some use cases? I think machine learning, and, and I am very biased, I will admit this, I think machine learning and data science actually has a lot more applicability than it's been given credit for, but it's been a lot less tangible. It's been a lot less accessible. It, the hype cycle around generative AI has, I think, largely come from the fact that it was immediately visible. It was immediately tangible to people who are not data scientists and machine learning experts, right? Everyone saw it and got to interact with it and saw how amazing we can be with data and AI and said, we want that. But the assumption is that there's magic in the box, right? That it's going to answer every question and it's just going to know and it's going to connect every piece of information ever under the sun. And those of us who've been in data for a while can certainly relate to the fact that it doesn't just miraculously have access to every piece of information. Try tying two systems together and bringing their data together and then figuring out how to join that data together to make any sense of it. And then, oh, by the way, every business is going to interpret those two pieces of information differently. So how AI can learn is still constrained by how we manage data and how we can bring that together to make sense of it. And then when you talk about what should happen, what will happen, LLMs aren't it, hun. They're going to give you some words that might just be word salad, it, whatever numbers it has, again, this comes to down to that reproducibility of results. If it spits out a number, it might as well have said nine versus eight. How does it know? It's not calculating that. It's calculating what word comes next, unless you have something else behind the hood that's actually going to calculate for you. Now, there are ways that they've been using generative AI techniques to do some of that, but frankly, most of the organizations that I talk to aren't going near that one right now. They're looking at it from the perspective of how do I deal with text, not how do I make this technique, this statistical technique, work with numbers. If they want that, they're using predictive modeling and prescriptive modeling, which is what we've had for a long time. And so whenever somebody says, well, what's likely to happen in the next month, what they actually want isn't. They want it in natural language, so the generative AI becomes a bit of a wrapper. But what they actually want is for a calculation to happen based on some real things that we can look at and say, what's the accuracy or the recall or the precision on these types of models so that we can say this is good enough to be used, we're, we're trusting enough in this number that it can be used. And then tell me that in natural language. It's really interesting what you're saying about also, I guess, thinking about the explosion of ChatGPT and actually how in some ways that was kind of a UI breakthrough. Like we had the API and then it being so accessible to so many people really opened people's eyes. But as you say, it's also not obvious some of the flaws unless we been working with the models for a while. For example, the inability to do math. And you just touched on it now in terms of how you can combine these models with other techniques and one thing that's really interesting and we talk about in workshops sometimes is the use of kind of agents with large language models. And I was wondering how you see this because I feel like it's somewhat in research still and perhaps in the pipeline for production maybe in a few years time. But I was wondering what, what kind of timelines do you see that for really entering the market? For these types of specific agents that get yeah. called by? For what it's worth, we've had customers that are doing that now. Oh, really? We had uh, several months ago already, we had a workshop in which one of our customers showcased an agent that they had built that basically would tap an API for a prediction. So it was looking at, I think it was out of stock predictions. So it, you know, they would say what's likely to be out of stock in this period of time. And so the model, you know, the LLM had these agents built in that said, okay, well, if you ask about this, I'm going to go ask the API and I'm going to send it some parameters that I can understand because you've given me some info about what I should be sending. And it's going to retrieve that back and then again, wrap it in some natural language. So I don't think that's as far as you might think. You know, I think that's part of what's happening today. That's really interesting and exciting, but perhaps a little bit scary as well. It's moving so fast. 
I guess the question that I have is a bit of a philosophical question. So we were talking about the flaws, you know, this black box models. They look very impressive. You can ask anything. They can come up with songs, with poems, with whatever you want. But could they also cause like knowledge confusion? So for instance, Rob and I, we had a workshop again, and we asked model what is vector search, Databricks vector search, and the model was trained before vector search was released. So it came up with a very bizarre explanation that reads well, but it even made up a name of an algorithm. I think it was like 100 miles per hour. like Hammer, 100 miles an hour, something, yeah. Yes. And I think, you know, getting this type of output can get very common and it can cause, you know, this avalanche of confusion. Do you agree? Absolutely. I and mean, this is part of what a lot of the, I won't say existential threat kind of theories are based on, but some of the ones where it's, you know, this could mess up democratic process. This could mess up, you know, quite a lot of different information cycles that unknowingly someone is going to trust that something is correct. And actually we've seen an, another example of this was there was a court case in which a lawyer cited things from an LLM, cited cases that didn't exist and was found liable for it. You know, they misrepresented their client because of it. And it's because when you ask the model to do something or to tell you about something, it's going to tell you about it, whether it actually knows anything about it or not. And this is something that's happened repeatedly where it just is it makes up a great story sounds really convincing you know it's it's a lot of very convincing nonsense but you know it, it absolutely is and I think this is where when I talk with a lot of our customers and you know others in the space they the biggest concern is how do we get users to not immediately believe the AI <laughs> like how AIs are there so that you don't have to do all of the additional work. But when you're using them in a context that isn't going to throw an error, like if I have it write some code and it writes the code and the code doesn't work or it throws an error at me, I'm like, oh, something is incorrect. I can go back into the code and figure it out. If it's a story, I have to still do the due diligence to make sure that story is true and that's something that takes a lot more thoughtfulness and due diligence than most users are likely to put forward. So just like we've seen the cycles of you know, fake news and fake images and all these things, fake stories coming from LLMs are in that same camp and you can't just assume that whatever comes out of an LLM is true. 100%, I think we need to start teaching good practices of prompt engineering or sources of hallucinations in elementary school and that's the future <laughs> or i mean when i was in school and this is i feel like we're at the we're at a similar point now with llms as where i was when i was coming out of high school going into uni where we were with the internet which is that you weren't allowed to cite the internet in your research you had to find the primary sources that were written that were checked that were validated because the internet was not seen as trustworthy. And then I remember when they actually started updating the reference styles of how to cite the internet. Now I feel like we're in the same boat with LLMs where we shouldn't really be citing these as fact. You need to still do the research. You need to still do the due diligence. And then the question becomes when you're not in an academic context where you actually have to cite sources, how do you go about that when the LLM doesn't tell you where it's getting its information? Which is one of the things I thought was very interesting, actually, when Bing came out with its search that had AI built in, and it was citing sources. And I think that that's really important, both for internal use cases and for external use cases, that it is important when you're looking at LLMs to say, where did this information come from and can you corroborate it so that you can see, in the case of the lawyer, for example, you would see it's, it doesn't have a source for this. It, where is this coming from? Or it wouldn't be able to refer to something that says, oh, yeah, that's this case here or what have you. And it would have been an easy flag to say, this is not real. But we don't have that yet. It's not built in yet. And the amount of transparency that's being required, even from a regulatory standpoint, doesn't include that, funny enough. it you know A lot of the, the requirements are like, you have to say that you're interacting with an AI. 
But the AI doesn't have to cite its sources. It doesn't have to tell you where it's gotten its information. So how much transparency do we really need? Yeah, how would you call it? Before we had the term explainable AI, or it's like referable AI, referenceable AI. Mm -hmm. So this is something definitely the next stage. A lot of what we're hearing is um, trusted AI or trustworthy AI. AI which is sort of the next evolution. And trust is an interesting thing because it, it's very easily broken. Um, and you know, trying to regain it takes a lot. And so I think the more we talk about the failings of AI and we break the trust a little bit, I think it's a good thing, frankly, because it, I don't want to say it takes away the value of AI. I don't think that's true. But I think it forces the issue of people saying, maybe I shouldn't just take this on face value. I think that's a really interesting note to end on, maybe. Thank you, Lexi. Hope to see you soon. Thanks for having me.